right, guys, let's get to it. Um, I apologize, you have to uh, deal with me um, having a scratchy voice from being in the middle on tour. Um, but uh, you also should be very grateful for Random House, or more accurately, my wife, for forcing Random House to do this. But they did fly me home in the middle of tour, get me a car service to BYU after my flight so I could come teach your class. So uh, this is like the most. <laughs> So thank you, Random House. Ah, most expensive university class ever, probably. <laughs> uh, no, tomorrow morning, I'll get out and fly, I think, to Denver. So questions um, from last week's. Last week, a lot of you guys wanted to know about agents. We will talk about agents. We're just not going to get to it today. It'll be during another one of the business uh, lectures. So. We will get to agents. Um, if you have one asking for your stuff, you can come get a preview by talking to me, uh, asking me questions. Um, how do I sign books in an airport without getting in trouble? <laughs> so there's this thing in the back of books called About the Author that has your picture. Um, so I've actually only ever been stopped like a couple of times. Most of the time I'm just signing. Um, and if they notice me, then I say, they say, oh, are you the author? It's almost always what they say. Once someone made me prove it, and I just opened up to the back. But they're actually pretty used to it. Um, I'm not the only author that does this. Bookstores get fairly used to authors coming through. People don't try to fake it that often, I guess. <laughs> um, could I get an editor to Skype in with you guys? Um, I might be able to, to pull that off. Let's see what I can swing. Um, I might be able to get Moshe, uh, my editor at Tor, or Krista, my editor at Random House, to, to Skype in. Um, that's a good question. Uh, was traditionally publishing the Stormlight Archive difficult because of how long the series is? Uh, no, because I already had an established name and reputation. Um, and the publisher uh, knew who I was. You know, they had already done business with me. I'm a known factor. Um, now, this br brings up something you should kind of know about, about publishing. Every book is going to have, this is kind of my, one of my weird things, every book's going to have these little red marks against it. In the reader's mind and in the editor's mind, every book that, that you pick up, there will be things about that book. It's uh, probably not, you know, the platonic ideal of a book written just for you as a reader. It might be. Maybe there's one out there. Most of the time you'll pick it up and you'll say, you know, I really like this cover blurb, but this, is, this looks really thick. And I don't normally read books this thick. Or conversely, you're like, I really like thick books and this one's really thin. Right? Um, or, you know, it'll say book one of a ten book series and that will make you skeptical. It always would make me skeptical if I hadn't read the author before to see a big series. Every book that you write Every book that you pick up has these kind of little red marks um, against them in the reader's mind, preventing them from getting into the book and coming to love it. Your job is not to get rid of all those, okay? For instance, if what you want to write is a big 400 word or 400,000 word epic fantasy, 400 word would be pretty small. Uh, Eric James Stone, he, um, he does a uh, little 400 word uh, stories he puts on the back of his business cards which is really cool. Um, but if you want to write a 400,000 word <clears throat> epic fantasy and that's your passion, you should not simply avoid doing that because the market says that's much harder to sell and people will be more skeptical. You should know that it's harder to sell as a first novel and that people will be skeptical. You should know that you're swimming upstream in that regard, but that's the piece of art that you want to write so you should do it, okay? However, what you sh shouldn't do is simply write one at 400,000 words because you think that's the way it should be done. You've just always seen it before, so you're like, well, it's what Brandon does, I'll just do that. You should write at that length because you love the book at that length. And indeed, if you're looking at the story you're writing, you say, wow, you know, this 400,000 word story, it can work as 300 and whatever, thousand word stories, 130,000 word stories or whatever, just as well, um, or it can work as one volume as, as 400,000. Knowing that and saying, ah, a, a 400,000 word book is a hard sell to publishers. Um, I will write the 130,000 word piece 
I will send that out if the publisher really likes it. Then I can say, you know, we also have the option to do a big, huge, epic fantasy in one volume if you'd like. It can go either way. Knowing, market, <clears throat> knowing the market can help you. Does that make sense? I ask that a lot, apparently. Uh, people mention it in, my, um, in, the, in the critiques. So, in this um, class, and when you talk to writers, they will mention things you shouldn't do, right? They will say, a middle grade usually caps out at about that 50,000 words. Um, a YA usually caps out at around 80,000 words. A science fiction is around 75 to 100,000, and a fantasy can go a little bit longer for a first novel by a writer. That's what publishers are kind of expecting to see. Those are, your, those are your thresholds. If it's over 120, 150,000 as a new writer for an epic fantasy, they'll get really skeptical. That's a red mark. Just write the piece of fiction that you want to write regardless. The last question on here was, uh, where do I get my shirts? <laughs> um, I actually just let my, uh, my wife and assistants and people come up with these. Uh, my sister was a minister at Nordstrom for, for many years. Uh, she you know, is very trendy. Um, and pretty, as opposed to, you know, myself. Um, <laughs> and one time we went up to her and said, hey, can you just dress Brandon? Yeah, it was kind of her job. She's a personal stylist. And just give me a style. And so the nerdy T-shirts plus the, the sports coat was kind of the thing she said, well, that'll work for you. Um, and then she picked the nerdiest T-shirt she could find, and my wife has made it um, her quest to find rotating nerdy T-shirts that aren't too distracting, but also kind of work with the sport coat. This one, by the way, is famous last lines from books. Um, came from a, from a bookstore that, um, that's an independent bookseller that Emily likes. All right, so lecture for today. We are going to kind of start bringing things together. Now that you've kind of had a lecture on each one of the main themes of the class. Uh, this is technically a character lecture, but it's going to draw from a lot of the things we've been talking about. And one of the things I wanted to get to first was the pyramid of abstraction, which was on the list to do during the, um, the prose lecture, and we didn't quite get around to it. It's important to what we're talking about today. So the pyramid of abstraction, uh, this is something that uh, a friend in grad school pitched to me as an idea, and I really liked it. Um, I've latched onto it. Um, and the idea for the pyramid of abstraction, it's kind of like the food pyramid, which apparently they don't use anymore, so you kids may not even know what a food pyramid is. Um, but the idea is that you, the bulk of your writing should be concrete. Concrete writing forms the foundation of your storytelling, and that concrete language grounds the reader in a scene and holds them there. Then, once a reader is grounded in a scene, you can start to get abstract. Various things are more abstract, and these kind of serve to pull the reader out of the scene. And so you don't want that to happen. What you want to do is have them get held in the scene by the concrete language so that drifting away doesn't happen. And the things that are abstract are often what we call navel-gazing. Uh, that's Harriet's, uh, one of my editor's favorite terms for it. Navel-gazing is the character getting introspective um, about themselves, about their problems. Um, and when it goes wrong, navel-gazing is like whining. But a little bit of navel-gazing is good as it's kind of the, the character being reflective. Um, it, abstractions may be any of these things where you slip into narrative and, um, and just explain something about the world, right? Anything that's you know, not the immediate action or setting detail is abstract. Now, the problem is if you do mostly this, if you put the pyramid on its head, you start to get some problems like um, the reader doesn't feel like they're in a scene. They don't attach to the character. It feels like it's just, you know, the, all these abstract ideas or world building instead of a story. Um, it's very like the food pyramid. If you can earn 
this with this, you will have a better story. Now, the trick is um, learning to actually pull things down the pyramid of abstraction whenever it is reasonable to do so. So your kind of natural inclination will be go, go, to go up, but stronger writing usually is pulling things down to an extent. For those who haven't listened to this lecture before, or things like this, I've got a little exercise that kind of talks about this. So if you have listened to the lecture, or if you know about the pyramid, just stay quiet for a little bit. Um, we'll let other people explore it. Um, if you're going to say something is abstract or concrete, um, let me ask you, where would you put the, a discussion of love? Right? Where, where, someone raise your hand. Where, where are you going to put that? Are you talking like... The character. Yeah, the characters love for another character. They're sitting there pondering about it. Where does that go? Is that, that that's, that's up at the top, right? This is kind of one of your abstractions. In fact, if you just use any time you're talking about a concept like love, you're abstract. Um, let's say you mention a dog in your story. Where on the pyramid of abstraction is, where are you then? Concrete. Concrete. You think a dog is concrete, right here? Let, let me ask you this. When I said dog, how many people in the room imagined the same dog? I would bet there's a different dog in everyone's head. And so dog certainly is more concrete than love, um, but it's really kind of up here. It's, it's pretty high. Um, now, this is, this is intentional, that that's kind of a trick question. Um, everyone answers that way. That's how I answered it first, too. Um, this is to get you thinking about the idea that if you want to really set a scene, you pull things down on the pyramid of abstraction through detail. You don't just say a dog. You say, you know, um, a wet, mangy poodle with one hurt leg whimpering in a puddle. Okay, we all imagined a very similar dog in that instance. Now, one thing you'll notice about pulling down, so that gets more, more concrete, right? Suddenly, instead of saying a dog, which is this like philosophical concept, you're in a scene. You saw that dog, you heard it. Um, you'll notice that pulling down on the pyramid of traction requires words. Almost always, what you are doing is you are trading words to pull someone down into a scene. That's why the question, the, 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 it, um, what I said earlier, not the question, but is that usually you want to pull people down. Not always. Your job, again, being a chef and not a cook, is to know what effect these sorts of things have on a reader and to use the right tool at the right time as determined by you. So if you want something to be more immersive, if you, get, if you have trouble with your reader saying, you know, I can't visualize what's going on, or I'm getting kind of lost, or it's just, it's, if I tell you um, when I'm reading your fiction, this is getting really telly. Telly is what we call that. What you need to be doing is either pulling down on the pyramid abstraction or cutting things out to make the telly bits more lean. You kind of need to go one direction or the other. We have this thing in writing where we call, which we call show don't tell. Show, don't tell is one of the cardinal rules of prose for uh, storytelling. Um, this means that an image or scene or experience in a book will be more memorable and powerful to a reader if they experience it rather than having it simply explained to them. Your job as a writer is to get those things across in an experiential way. The classic example of this is to, instead of saying, he was a nervous type man, to show him sitting and tapping his foot with his uh, arms folded. He was a nervous type man takes usually fewer words than, you know, he paced back and forth, you know, checking his watch every 30 seconds. But one gives you an image of actually what type of person the, the, uh, the character is, and one just tells you. Yes? So, 
I'll try to do that to have it be more show and less tell. But I feel sometimes when I'm trying to expand on what's happening, that it's forced. Yeah. That it sounds fake. Sometimes it sounds fake. You, practice will make it sound less fake. That's a really good question. Um, practice will help you here. And the other thing is, this adage, like everything in writing, is really more a matter of show when you want to and tell when you want to, rather than never tell. Um, telling can do some, some good things. Telling can get you um, to action faster. It can pass time. Um, you'll see J.K. Rowling is actually pretty good at knowing where to show versus tell. If you want somebody who's, uh, who's a, who's, who can draw a narrative like this, you'll see a scene with the kids talking about things, and then she'll drift into tell and let three weeks pass, right? Um, and she'll get across a couple lines of what they discovered, and then she'll show you another scene where a big revelation is made. The big revelations don't happen in the tells, but the tells are very important for the way she writes to stitch scene to scene to scene. Now, thriller place pacing, which goes really breakneck, usually doesn't tell anything except disguised as dialogue, which a lot of people do tells as dialogue. They don't ever want you to get these moments to sit back and, and have this, you know, introspective time. They want it to always be moving. You'll have to decide how you want to pace your stories and things like this. Um, but generally, it's, it's kind of this weird thing where oftentimes using more words can make a scene pass more quickly. You'll learn how this works. Um, you would think that all, more words would make the scene pass more slowly. But if you're setting the scene and building the tension and, and doing this sort of thing, doing a good setup so that then you can do an action sequence where the reader knows where everyone is and can keep track of them easily or a good big dialogue will actually make that scene by the end zip, have zipped past way faster than if you had been left a lot of that out, left the reader confused, had to insert it in between here and there um, and kind of crammed it down their throats. Okay, I'm going to talk about that next, um, I think. But first, are there any questions about this idea of the pyramid of abstraction or show versus tell? Is it possible to spend too much time at the bottom of the pyramid and end up coming off like an instruction book? Um, <clears throat> if you're spending a lot of time, let, let me talk some more about this. I think you, you, you ask a good question. Um, this should not sound like an instruction book. If it does, you're actually getting up here, okay? Um, the instruction book stuff is, you know, the magic works like this, this and this and this. That's actually not what we want for concrete. What we want is he grabbed the crystal and felt it vibrate, right? It was, it, you know, the blue light slipped through his fingers and he could suddenly, and while he was touching it, he could hear his father's voice even though his father was dead. He took the crystal and placed it in the device and then jumped back, right? These are... This doesn't feel like an instruction book. If instead you say, in this world, using crystals, you know, draws on your own memories to power machines. Um, that is an instruction book and you have just gone abstract. Okay? Instruction book is not concrete. Um, the way to get down here is to remember all five senses taste is hard. Don't have your characters go licking things. <laughs> um, but at least remember, um, once you, when you can get sounds and sense as well as sight, um, that immediately starts pulling things down the pyramid abstraction. And newer writers, in fact, established writers, we all kind of fall into the describe only the sights trap. And then occasional sounds. If you can get how warm or cold someone is, if you can get the, the feel of the cloth on their skin, um, these sorts of things will pull you down on the pyramid of abstraction, um, and that's what's going to keep you from feeling like an instruction book. Okay? Yes, back there. Um, just to try and understand this a little better, I'm not sure I'm clear. Uh -huh. Abstract versus concrete. Would it be like concrete is what is happening, and abstract is how they feel about it? No. Like no, not necessarily. The feeling could be part of the abstract, 
But the example I just gave before is abstract too. Abstract in this context means not set distinctly in a scene so that you know who is doing what and you are there with them. That concrete is being there with them. Abstract is the reader telling you about them. It's the difference between um, like what I just said. Um, you know, John knew that in this world, when you take a crystal, you, are, you experience the memories of the past, and then you put it in the machine and it sucks those memories away and powers the machine to do various cool things. That's abstract. It's the way that a whole bunch of you are writing your stories. Okay? Um, concrete is, again, John touched the crystal worried about what it might do to him. He tapped it and he heard a ringing sound, remembered his father's voice. He timidly picked it up and tried to focus on something he hated. You know, like, you know, the taste of squash, how it got between his teeth and just mushed around. Ah, maybe if he could get rid of that memory, he would never have to taste squash again. He stepped up to the machine, uncertain what it would do. It hummed and made, sorry, I gotta step back. I'm sucking on lashes. Um, it hummed, you know, I'm going overboard. Does it make sense? But it hummed and he could feel the vibrations. Um, and he then set it down and felt an immediate sharp pain run up his fingers into his skull. And suddenly squash tasted like popcorn to him. I don't know. Um, that's a scene. That's concrete. So it's experience? No, it is a scene. It is a scene. Um, and you're just going to have to learn how to do this by reading and experiencing. Um, I mean, those two things are very different things. Um, one is you telling the reader, and one is you showing the reader through the experience of a character. Yes? I'd like to do a continuation of that previous mm -hmm. question. Because, okay, so if you get into instruction manual mode, it's too abstract. But is there a level to concreteness? Too abstract is a value judgment. It is abstract, and most writing should avoid that unless you want to do it intentionally. Is it possible to be too concrete? Is it possible to be too concrete? Certain, certain, yes, if, when you're being too concrete. Um, but it depends on which type of reader you are. A lot of literary fiction lives down here. Now, you would think that literary fiction would live up here. It's dealing with like dreams and ideals. But a lot of schools of thought on literary fiction are very much about this kind of lush language. Um, Pat Roth, this is really good at this stuff. Um, Ursula Le Guin can be very, very good at this stuff. Or she can write stories that take place completely here, which is, you know, why there are no rules. Have you read The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas? If you haven't, you should read it. It is a story that consists ex almost 100% of abstraction. It even starts with like a pretend that there's a land that's kind of like this. It might be like this, it might be like that. Um, it is the, like the guidebook of how to do tell, write, and to make a whole story out of it. If you compare uh, the ones who walk away from Omelas to, for instance, um, I don't know, uh, something like Most Dangerous Game, which, or Harrison Bergeron. Harrison Bergeron's a, a better example, uh, which is another very short dystopian classic. They're both dystopian classics. Harrison Bergeron is very showy. Um, it shows you living in a character's eyes um, and the experiences that they go through, even though this character sits in a chair for the whole story. Um, so, yes, for certain, if you're doing this a lot, it will kind of get, it'll feel like muddy. It'll feel like suddenly the language and the feel of the scene and how everything tastes and whatnot is the point of the story. But that might be the point of your story. You might have read literary fiction that is like that. Um, and that's why people read it. So, um, yeah. First time I heard you talk about the pyramid of abstraction mm -hmm. was on writing excuses. And you yeah. were talking about it in conjunction with writing dialogue and dialogue tags. Yes. So writing dialogue and dialogue tags. I don't know if I have time to get into dialogue right now. I'll probably do it in the second prose lecture uh, because there's so many other things to do. I, I talked about it there because that was a good place for it. Um, but 
let's focus on it for description here. Description and scene setting is where, where we really are right now. Okay. Um, because, and I'll move on to this, but it's the same idea. So if you have more questions, we'll chew on this for a little bit longer. Um, what I call the grand skill of writing science fiction and fantasy is the ability to convey world building information down here instead of up here. And this is, you know, the art of the info dump. An info dump in science fiction, fantasy, or in any writing is where you're like, they need to know about these crystals, right? That steal your memories and replace them with other memories and then power machines. My story cannot work unless the reader is intimately familiar with how this magic system works. I have to find a way to convey this. Beyond that, I have to find a way to convey the character's relationship with uh, her father, or I have to find a way to convey, you know, that this character's memories of their childhood were stolen by one of these machines that, you know, powers an airship that, you know, I don't know, whatever, right? You have to get all, you have like, I have all of this stuff I need to get. It's that idea when I talked about learning curve, you've got all these things that you need to get across to people. Well, you need to learn, need to, again, value judgments. You likely want to learn <laughs> how to convey this in the way that is the most uh, gripping, interesting, and least boring. Okay, uh, years ago there were this rash of cookbooks which were all about how to hide vegetables so that kids would eat them, right? My wife does this every morning. She puts spinach in the smoothies. Um, the kids love smoothies. Uh, the spinach makes them green. My wife has convinced them that that is cool, that having green smoothies is cool, and that the spinach is just the stuff that makes them green. Um, so they drink them happily and get spinach. So your world building information is your spinach. This is what ultimately is going to be a big part of what distinguishes your story from other stories. It is going to be, if you're doing it right, what makes the character motivations work. It's what grounds them in their society. Um, it's just really important, but it is spinach. Some of you like spinach, that's okay. Just pretend you don't for a few minutes. Um, and you need to hide it in the story rather than giving them a paragraph where they suddenly say, wait a minute, this is the spinach. And get bored. Learning how to use the pyramid of abstraction is or like similar methods. Not everyone even thinks about this thing. Um, what they talk about is show versus tell. And what they talk about is using character as a conduit for expressing world building. This is why this is a character lecture. Um, last time we talked about characters, we dealt with kind of how to make your characters pro-tag, right? How to make them active versus inactive, how to, whether you want to have them be very hyper-competent, whether you want to have them be flawed, all of these sorts of things for kind of twisting dials and making characters work. Now we're going to talk about really cementing that character into a story. Um, the idea is that the character is the lens through which you, know, you are presenting any given scene. Just like a director might use kind of a, a different type of lens or a different type of filter, the character is your filter. This is particularly true if you're using third person limited, or first person, um, any of the various first persons. Uh, sp but more specifically, kind of the more immediate first person, um, which is most common. Um, you then use that character and the way they see the world as the way you get this all across. And you do that through something I am going to call proms, not the dance, right? Um, when you think about a character, this is just a little handy mnemonic. I was thinking about what, what are the kinds of things that really distinguish a character on the page for me. Um, and it's a, it's a mixture of these things. So <clears throat> their past, their relationships, 
um, their obligations, their motivations, and their sensibilities. And that kind of just worked out to actually be an acronym, so I was happy with that. On here it's written P-M-R-O-S, um, so it's like the dyslexic version on my notes. Um, all of these things are a way of kind of looking at who your character is, what their relationship to the setting around them is, and the idea is every line that you write in your story <laughs> should in some way be trying to do multiple things. This is a uh, classic adage of fiction. Make every line do multiple things. Kurt Vonnegut talked a lot about this concept. One of the ways to accomplish that is to make every line of description showing something about the past relationships, obligations, motivations, sensibilities, something about the character in the way they describe the world, okay? Uh, I often use the example because I, I worked on the Wheel of Time, one of, my, one of my favorite stories of the glass of water, right? In the Wheel of Time, there's a character from a desert culture where there's very little water. When she looks at a cup of water, how does she describe it? Has anyone read the books? How, how would Avienda describe it, that thing of water? Precious. Precious, right, right. Yeah. Well, how might she respond like in a concrete way? She walks in here and sees that. Why is that left unattended? Yeah, is someone going to steal that? Exactly. Um, but let's say uh, you are instead, you know, um, what, what else can we get? Let's, let's say, okay, you are a, a fan of the Stormlight Archive. How do you describe this instead? Hey, cool sticker, where'd you get that? <laughs> right? You don't even notice the water inside. Two different responses to the exact same thing. Um, with Avienda, what you're getting across is, you know, her past, her relationships, and her sensibilities, and the way that she responds to water. Whereas you, theoretically, or I might see it and be like, ah, you know, it reminds me of the fact that I am sick and my voice is going out because I've been on tour, right? So I see this water, and to me, it may not be precious, and it may not be who stole it. It says, oh, good, Isaac is here. He brought my water. I'm not going to have a scratchy throat um, through the course of this. Um, and so my description of it could be getting across my relationship with one of my friends and assistants through a line of description, rather than just saying a cup of water sat on the table. Again, the grand skill is kind of learning how to use this and when, because if every line digs deeply into this lush sort of, you know, a verdant, you know, green, right, verdant, a, a verdant thing of water sat on the table, um, coursing with life energy, it made him think about how water was the, you know, you, you don't want to go into that. Uh, but somebody who's a germ phobe might, might say, oh, he sounds like he's sick. I bet there are a ton of germs on that thing. I don't want to touch it. Oh, how many people have been sick in this room? He's breathing on me, um, right? Which gets across some um, their sensibilities, how they f see the world, their mindset. Um, so I want to kind of talk about this, and let's do a show versus instead of me just telling you, right? Let's, uh, let's come up with some, some quick characters and talk about how they might see the world differently from one another. Um, all right, so <clears throat> uh, give me an age. Just raise a hand, your hand. Uh, what, day, what age? 24. 24, okay, give me an age. 56. 56, okay, give me an age. 12. 12, okay. 24-year-old, uh, male or female? Male. Uh, raise your hand, there's too many people. Someone raise your hand. Say, okay. Male. Male, okay. 
What unusual job does this 24-year-old male have? Grave robber. Grave robber, great. <laughs> All right, 56-year-old male, female. Yeah. Female. Unusual job. Mortician. Mortician. <laughs> okay, not death-related in this one. Male or female, raise your hand. Male. Male. Okay, what's the unusual job? She's a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Let's get a different one. <laughs> We're trying to show contrast here. Give me a different weird job. I'm on the whipping boy. Whipping boy, okay. It's already been. <laughs> okay. So, 24-year-old male grave robber lives in an unusual location. What is the unusual location? Hawaii. Hawaii. Okay. <coughs> I need one of these. Thank you, Isaac. 50-year-old um, female mortician lives in an unusual location. It does not have to be a state or something like this. Las Vegas. Um, let's do not a city. Let's do a diff. Let's push harder. Well, it, not in a specific city or, or place. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I want something different than that. Yeah. Motel. A motel. See, there we go. I want. I want. Yeah. All right. Um, whipping boy. Where does the whipping boy live? Covered under the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Overdone. Ah, uh, right here. On an iceberg. Okay. All right. Last one. Um, deep dark secret that the grave robber does not want people to discover about him. He's afraid of blood. He's afraid of blood. Okay. All right. Uh, our mortician who lives in the motel. Deep dark secret. Killed someone. Who'd she kill? Uh, brother. Her brother. <laughs> Who is now a zombie? <laughs> a 12-year-old right. zombie? What's that? A 12-year-old zombie? No. no. He's in a different story. They can maybe be in the same story. This guy's in a different one. Uh, deep Dark Secret. That's how we can take just one more path. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, it's always fun to see what are on, is on people's minds. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, di death, disease. Uh, I guess it's because I'm sick. You guys are like, oh, zombies. Um, so, now, what you would want, want to do for a writing exercise is you want to convey this secret and this location through the way that the character describes something very simple. Okay? Can you do it? You think so? You can do it? He glanced at the icebox uneasily, hoping they would notice his spots so they wouldn't walk in it. Okay. Yeah, you could say that people have landed on his iceberg or something like that. They, they, okay. Well, what else? Give me another one. Any one of these things just think about them for a few minutes. Um, I want you, again, to convey something. You don't have to get the whole thing across, but a hint of this and where the location is without saying either one, okay? Sometimes when she was working late at night, she would blink and the corpse's face would be his. Oh, see, wow, say that one really loud. That was great. Sometimes when she was working late at night, she would blink and the corpse's face would be his. Okay. Very nice. Now, um, give me another sentence that pulls us down on the, um, the pyramid of abstraction. What could you do that would do that? Um, embalming fluid. Embalming fluid, pulling out of one of the refrigerated drawers that they have. In yeah. The and, yep, yep. I think didn't Dan in his mortuary story always talk about the fan that didn't work real well? that they go into the fan wouldn't work real well, and so the scent smells of the mortuary would get overpowering. 
when he did a mortician, he did that specifically to give an auditory cue and an excuse for why he could describe the sense and things like that. So your line is great. You're doing what I want. It's conveying all this stuff. But you got to remember, we also, you know, want to start pulling these things down as well. All right, what else? You guys got one? Go ahead. Uh, he looked at the dog and thought it looked warm in his thick coat. He wished he had one like it. Ah, there you go. That's very nice. Um, now, if you want to pull that down on the pyramid traction, go for it. Uh, Describe the dog. Get me some sounds. Get something. Uh, he reached down and pet the fat dog, admiring its thick coat. Dreaming of killing it and making his own. <laughs> I mean, we are talking about, you know. Yeah. No, that's good. <coughs> um, anyone else got one they want to give us? Yeah. Yeah, so for the kid who's 12, uh -huh. you can explain that he's a whipping boy by, like, hoping that the gentleman who's whipping him doesn't step in his blood and get his contagious disease. Oh, or hoping that he does. Yeah. <laughs> You could start with a line of dialogue. It's like, if you hit me again, you might get it. Right. You know, um, if I start bleeding, everyone on the ship is dead. Um, yeah, when you start using this stuff, um, when you start trying to convey this information without saying, he was a 12-year-old whipping boy with a terrible disease, and he worried that if he started bleeding, everyone on the ship would die, that's okay but you can move it a little bit more into character and into the character's eyes um, and then make it more intriguing and more immediate. Did anyone else have one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for the graveyard robber, yep. be something along the lines of, the earth was warm and soft, too soft. He was always afraid of digging too deep. Um, or the, yeah. Cutting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like going with the, you know, the, the, you know, he, uh, you, I would probably go with, you know, how sweaty he is digging with the soft earth and worrying that they might get back out because everything's so soft here. Um, something like that. I don't know. I don't know. The dirt in Hawaii is actually not that much softer. There's lots of things growing. It's actually going to be harder to dig, but at least it won't be frozen. Uh, what, what, someone else had one over here that they wanted to give us. Go for it. Just for the same line. Yeah, go for it. At the edge of the cemetery, there was a many rooted banyan tree growing down tearing up the dirt and likely shattering the coat of coffee underneath. And it would make this job harder, but... Yeah. There you go. Good. Very good. Um, so the, the job that I want you to do is start thinking about things like this. Uh, if you want, you know, I don't give much homework in this class because your homework is just go right. Uh, but if you ever want to have a fun experience, do something like this where you come up with three characters, take these three characters, and then come up with a situation. Um, whatever it is, like, you know, a, a couple of beats. Whereas, you know, uh, it's going to be harder for a boy who lives on an iceberg, maybe he's from an iceberg, to make that a little easier. And you come up with kind of the same situation. There's a car wreck, and they're walking on the street, you know, admiring ice cream in the, in the window of an ice cream shop, or at least looking at it. There's a car wreck behind them, and they see a dead body. If you write those three, these three characters in those, that situation with the points of the ice cream, uh, the maybe not being able to afford it, and then the car wreck and the dead body, and show their responses differently, and show how they describe the world differently, you'll begin to practice how to do this with your characters. The whole goal is that your very descriptions will evoke who the character is and their relationship to the world around them. Okay, so um, for this stuff, I'll talk just briefly about these things. Um, character past. This doesn't mean that we need to be conveying everything about a character. We don't need to know what they, you know, their favorite food was when they were in second grade. Um, that's not what this means. The idea is that there will be things in the past of each character who have ha that have helped shape who they are and which are relevant to your story. These will leave emotions on the character, in the character, and the things they see will remind them of things in their life. And this is, writers sometimes go wrong by pretending that the character just kind of popped into existence at the beginning of the story. That's not how it is 
for us. Um, everything that we see, touch, smell, generally reminds us of things in our past. This classroom reminds me of teaching this class previous years, which reminds me of students from previous years and things like that. Um, seeing the video cameras reminds me of Earl, my good friend, who I was roommates with for like 10 years or something like that. Um, and so there's different things. And then that makes me smell Denny's because we'd always go out to Denny's, you know, late at night together when we didn't have any money and that's all we could afford. Um, that's how the human brain works. I don't want you to overload on this, but when you're adding touches of things like this in, it will give a personal touch to your descriptions. The goal is not to go extraneously describe everything. Um, the goal is to take the descriptions you already were going to use and make them have a flavor of characterization to them. <coughs> uh, Dan, uh, my writer friend who has a new book out as of Tuesday. You should all read it. It's blue screen. It's really good. Um, Dan often points out that what works for him, and I think he's really good at all of this. In fact, um, I'm not a serial killer. It's like a textbook example of how to do a lot of this stuff. Um, says that if you s describe the small details of a room and let them evoke a larger setting, you will have a better picture painted often than if you try to describe the whole room. This is the example you know we use on writing excuses sometimes of uh, a room where the, um, the, sh the uh, shutter is half off on the window and there are bullet holes, that simple detail tells you a whole bunch about the room. So you don't need to go into the fact that it's you know, in a rundown part of town um, you know, and that drug deals have happened here. You see that and you, know, you see maybe you know, a blood stain on the floor or you know, whatever. You give the little details that are stark, concrete, details and let the reader paint in the rest. That's the way that he likes to do it. So, pass. Uh, relationships. <coughs> <coughs> Conveying how people feel about one another through the way that they describe the, the, the world or the way that they <coughs> engage in their dialogue in discussions with other people. Uh, this is gonna be the foundation of most stories, right? Relationships. Um, you're going to spend the majority of the time in most stories with two characters or three characters interacting in hopefully interesting ways. Uh, the rest of it will be them maybe doing adventuresome stuff. Um, getting this down, making it kind of color every line of description. This doesn't mean simply the overt things like, you know, the locket reminded her of her, you know, of her mother or things like that. But it doesn't have to be as overt of that is that um, if two brothers kind of have an adversarial relationship in that they're always trying to one-up one another, the way that you describe how they even sit down can convey that instead of just letting that, you know, they sat down. It could be, you know, he sat down and then the other brother took a book, set it under him and sat down so he was a little bit higher. It's a funny example, but do you see what I'm saying? Just, not just doing actions, but having them convey personality and relationships is going to do more with each line and that's going to help your stories be more memorable. Um, obligations for this one, I'm uh, mostly kind of talking about the social constructs that people have, that, have a, that they live in, the, the society they live in. Um, the fact that in Korea you don't show the bottom of your foot to people and you treat people with, even people you dislike with a certain measure of respect. There are societies where the more, even the more respectful you get, it can often show that you dislike them more and more. You can convey these things through description and dialogue without having to say, this is what happens. Uh, motivations, as I talked about in my character um, lesson, I think that losing sight of character motivation is one of the prime reasons that, um, that readers, I mean, that, that writers have characters that feel stilted. This is when the character is saying something to move the plot along, but n the reader does not understand why that particular character would engage in this argument. Oftentimes, there's these moments in, uh, in uh, new writer's fiction where me thinks you protest too much, right? Where the characters like get in an argument just to prove a point, and they will belabor a point over and over again to try to, you know, to move the plot along. Where meanwhile, I'm sitting here thinking, why does this character care so much? 
You have not explained to me who they are enough to make me care about why they care. Um, and then sensibilities is kind of the unique um, brain chemistry we all have where we, uh, we see things in interesting ways. Some people look at uh, a, a pile of pencils and think, ooh, I want to draw something. Well, someone else says, one of them is pointing the wrong way. Is that anybody here? <laughs> um, so sensibilities. I also kind of put passions in, uh, in here, likes and dislikes. Uh, some people are dog people. Some people are cat people. Describing a dog from the eyes of a dog person might be different from describing it from a cat person, which might be different from describing it uh, from the viewpoint of an old starving person during the war. <laughs> right? So, um, convey these things. Don't just let your descriptions be descriptions. Let's go ahead and do questions on character for like 15 minutes here. Um, we'll do overlapping brackets next week. Uh, we'll go, that's a plotting thing. I was going to transition to that, but we'll do, we'll do another week on plotting next week. So uh, questions, anything on character that you want to know, or basically anything that you want to know at all about the class, you've got 15 minutes for just questions. Yeah? Do you ever find that you discover aspects about your characters you didn't know when you first conceived them as you're writing them? Do I ever discover aspects about the characters that I didn't know when I can seize them as I write them? Um, yes, this happens very frequently. Um, that is because my own kind of personal path to writing stories has been that um, I am an outliner when it comes to things like setting and plot, and I'm a discovery writer with character. Um, I have found that like the big problem with outlining too much is often the characters feel wooden. But the big problem with discovery writing is that your endings are usually lame. Um, you can fix this by, as a discovery writer by doing a solid revision once you know what your ending is. Brainstorming with friends, which with Dan and Kaylin, my friends who are discovery writers, they'll finish a book and say, okay, guys, let's brainstorm how to actually write a good ending to this book. Um, and then, you know, Kaylin will usually start on page one, it's extreme, and write it from scratch again. Dan just does a heavy revision to point toward an ending. Um, the way, being a natural outliner, that I kind of try to make up for the foible of characters feeling too wooden is I found that if I planned my characters out, they did feel wooden. So now I come out with a, with a world, I build, start building a plot, then I do chapters from the eyes of certain characters I've started to plan and see who they grow into in those sample chapters. Then once I have them, I can go back to my outline and, and build a uh, more solid outline. Then I go back and I start writing. And then if the character is developing in a way that I like, but which does not match the outline, I rebuild the outline to match who, they're, who they are. Does that make sense? I asked it, I did it again. I always do that. Um, now you guys are all going to notice it every time. Uh, writers have tells, by the way. Did I talk about this? Every writer, every one of you will have certain phrases and words that you end up liking more than everyone else and you will not be able to help yourself but use them. Do not let this destroy your ability to write once you notice what they are. Don't, don't worry about them. If it really stresses you, you can do something at Microsoft Word where once you finish the story, do a search and replace with track changes on for that word, replacing it with the same word. What that means is when you go and do a draft, every time that word shows up, it'll be highlighted, and then you can choose to keep it or change it to something else. Um, don't let it become, the, it's, it's actually famous in writing circles that sometimes once you notice what one of your words is, that it, it really hampers your ability to write because you keep writing into that word. So, um, but anyway, What's there you go. Word? What's that? What's your word? Uh, inchoate was one of mine earlier, and maladroitly was another big one. Um, yeah, somebody, a few of you are nodding if you've noticed maladroitly in the Mistborn book. That was totally one of mine. Um, yeah. Is there ever any danger of releasing a weaker first or second, maybe third book? Is there a danger of releasing a weaker first, second, or third book? Yes, there is. But it is balanced by the danger of running out of food. 
and never being able to you know, actually make it as a writer. You have to start at some point. Your skill is never going to be as good as it will be tomorrow. And so you have to pick a point where you're willing to release something. Now, <clears throat> I do know that some authors who've uh, gotten famous for first novels feel chained to that first novel. But usually if they get famous for a first novel, it's a first novel that takes off super huge and they are crying in their piles of money. Um, <laughs> and so it's a, it's a really good problem to have. Um, but you know, Twilight was a first novel um, and uh, I, I don't know Stephanie, but I know Christopher Paolini and he talks about Aragon. I mean, like I wrote this when I was 15, right? I, I can see that it you know, has first novel problems. It's way better than anything I wrote when I was 15 or that probably anyone in this room wrote when they were 15. Um, but he looks back at that. But I, I've asked him, like, would you, would you give it up? He's like, no, I mean, I've loved my career. Um, but he does want to escape the idea that he was a 15-year-old writer because he's in the 30s now, right? Um, so, yes, there is a danger, but I don't think it's worth stressing about too much. Um, I do think it is a little bit more of a chain around your neck um, in self-publishing where people don't always have um, as good a support structure to kind of know when their books are getting good enough that people should be paying for them. And I'm dancing around this because I don't know where that line is. I, I think I might have felt too early that my books were ready. But by the time I was writing Elantris, White Sand, and Dragon Steel and things, they were good enough that my support structure said, yes, these are good enough to pay for. Um, and I would have been fine at that point launching, even though it was years later that I finally sold, and I'm kind of glad that those, I don't release those books now. I don't, I don't sell those books um, except for Elantris, which you know I did, uh, I did revise and release. The other ones I, are just trunk novels. They sit in the trunk of the car. And, um, so I wouldn't stress this too much. Um, I wouldn't put up your first or second novel for self-publishing um, unless you've spent a few years writing more things and learning more about the business. I wouldn't write something this year and immediately release it, but what do I know? I mean, when, the self, when, uh, when Joe comes in, who, who is in the trench of self-publishing, you might say the exact opposite thing. So ask some other authors their opinion on that one, okay? Yeah. How do you feel about writing a series versus writing one-off? I mean, I know you're- Yeah, how do I feel about writing a series versus one-off? Specifically as a new writer, um, a lot of the, the phrase that people bandy about that I heard a bunch is to write standalone novels with sequel potential. Uh, this is to keep the, the red marks um, from being too strong against you in either direction. Um, every editor or reader finishes a book that they love. The number one question they will ask is, where's the sequel? Um, but a large number of people starting a story by an author they haven't heard of before want to know that it is a complete story and they're not roping themselves into getting a cliffhanger and not being sure if this author can ever even finish something. Um, so all things being equal, um, you would, you know, in a perfect world, write a 100,000 word-ish book that has a killer ending, comes to a conclusion, and then really sells a sequel that could happen after you've had a full experience. Um, the reason people like series is because of this learning curve thing. You get to be an expert in something you've now invested a lot of time and effort into and attachment to. Um, I think there's something strong to be said for your first release being a standalone, um, because I did that and it was very good for me. But, yeah. Um. Pretty much everyone that I have talked to says that your first novel, your first novel is garbage. So like you write it to write it and then mm -hmm. you put it away and don't ever do anything with it. Is that yeah. true? Is it true that your first novel is garbage? So conventional wisdom is that your first novel is generally terrible. Um, I will say yes with an asterisk. Um, there are first novels that are brilliant. Um, most of the time they get revised a whole bunch and the writer practices a whole bunch more and then releases it. But Name of the Wind and Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone were both first novels. Um, and they're both excellent books. Um, both went through heavy revision. And most writers seem to do better by writing a book, then putting that aside, writing something else 
then coming back and revising it, then writing something else. But there is a subset of writer that they write the one thing and then they learn the process through extensive and exhaustive revision and tweaking of that st one story instead. It's very dangerous because a lot of people that don't break out of that get trapped in that one story and never, it doesn't actually get better, it just gets differenter, right? Every time they revise it, it's kind of a different story um, and they, they don't end up learning how to consistently write and things like that. But, I mean, there are certain writers that that method is what created their whole career. Um, but, you know, I look at um, Pat, whom I love, as a writer, and I think one of the issues he's had is that he didn't learn to write a whole bunch of different things novel-wise. Um, and so he doesn't have the training and practice that uh, someone who wrote a whole bunch of books will have. But conversely, what he's gained from that is a really powerful attention to detail and prose that a lot of writers who write a whole bunch of books before they get published don't have. So there's trade-offs. Um, other questions? Yes? Uh, in the publishing world, do they prefer that you confine yourself to one genre? In the publishing world, do they prefer that you confine yourself to one genre? And we'll do this as the last question, I realize we're running out of time. Um, marketing departments prefer that you do. Um, you are not the marketing department. You should write what you're passionate about. Um, and this is a, the give and take here is having a brand that does lots of different things means if one of those doesn't end up working or tanks, you have a your diversified portfolio. Same thing within economics, right? The danger is that the marketing people will hate it and the editors are like, we're trying to establish you as this one thing. Why are you giving an inconsistent brand, okay? All right, guys, turn your slips in. Thank you guys for coming. Next week, you'll have a substitute. Camerapanda.com allows you to find cameras and lenses like no other site. Find the Nikon Coolpix cameras with the highest base ISO, or Canon cameras with full frame sensors. Find Sony E mount zoom lenses ordered by Aperture in just three clicks. Camerapanda.com shows you prices from up to 30 different sellers. CameraPanda.com, striving to be the world's best camera and lens shopping site.